Hi, I'm Bruce Campbell. You might know me from the Evil Dead trilogy or from such classics as Mind Warp or Maniac Cop 2. Or maybe not. Horror movies. What is their appeal? Why do we shell out hard-earned cash to have our pants scared off us? And why do we keep going back for more? Tonight, the masters of horror are going to reveal how they freak out audiences, how they make us love to be terrified. But who are the masters? Those warped, twisted monkeys who created some of the bloodiest, scariest, and most deranged images ever to terrorize the silver screen. John Carpenter, Wes Craven, George Romero, Toby Hooper, Dario Argento, John Landis, Rick Baker, Guillermo del Toro, and more. For years, their movies have given us nightmares, and tonight, we get a rare look inside the darkest minds of terror. They'll show us their most disturbing moments from their films, reveal all the tricks they use to horrify us, and even share the real-life nightmares that inspired the greatest horror movies ever. So lock your doors, shut your windows, and turn off the lights, because we're about to get schooled by the masters of horror. Why do people like to be scared? Uh, some people like hot peppers, you know? Uh... Some people like roller coaster rides. I believe these horror films are a catharsis. You know, I mean, I like the. I think that, you know, I think we need to let off that energy. I think for the same reason they enjoy laughing at the movies or crying, because these are feelings and they need to be expressed. For a lot of us, it's an addiction. And you just get more and more refined and demanding. Well, I, I kind of agree with Stephen King, who said that horror films are rehearsals for our own death. People want that. I think it's a cathartic sort of thing that they seek that out in order to reaffirm their bravery and their courage. And a horror movie is a chance to kind of allow that fear to come to the surface and sort of act it out. And, and when you walk out after you've sort of survived the horror movie, you kind of feel like, you know, you know, I'm still here, you know, and I made it. We empathize with that victim, you know, that's being chased by the guy in the hockey mask, the guy with the machete, the guy with the finger blades, the bloodsucker, whoever it is. You do stories where the worst thing you can imagine is confronted by a character that you care about. And in, in that sense, I think they're messages of hope. Horror is countercultural. It's about the fact that the world isn't as nice as we want to believe. It scares being scary, like getting people to jump is not hard. It's a loud sound and a quick motion. You know, and you jump. It's not hard to horrify somebody. If you're gross enough, you'll horrify somebody. If you show a shredded child or a or a dead, you know, mangled corpse or something oozing, you know, you can be horrible. It's that anticipation that's the thing that always kills you. The, you know, the things that I've learned, I guess, is that what you imagine is always much worse than anything that they can show you. I think the most difficult type of horror to do is something you can believe in your heart. Because it's so, I mean, how do you come up with those concepts? Jaws is the perfect horror movie because who can deny it? You know, some people are afraid of heights. Some people are claustrophobic. Um, you know, some people are terrified of, of rats. Whatever it is, everybody has different fears. People ask, used to ask me all the time, what are you afraid of? What are you afraid of? Death? Loss of a loved one? Loss of identity? Disfigurement? I mean, there's lists, lists of things that, that are our fears. Well, one of the primal things about, that horror is based on is the, is the kind of the horror of the body itself. And one horror is that it's just so damn vulnerable. You know, I mean, we only have this thin little skin keeping all of our insides and blood in, and it's so easily gotten at. All of us are afraid of the same things. We're born afraid. 
it's the reason there's religion. <laughs> you know, it's because we're all scared of the dark. Where do the masters get their deranged ideas? What dark part of the mind do monsters like Freddy Krueger escape from? It's the stuff that nightmares are made of. But actually, the inspirations may be very real. Wes Craven knows that sometimes the truth is scarier than fiction. I think the, the basis of most of my films is essentially true life. I mean, in some form, I haven't done many, with the exception of maybe Swamp Thing, any really like supernatural monster type things. And uh, I have found a lot of uh, really compelling stories just in newspapers or books. Uh, Hills of Eyes, Serpent and Rainbow, uh, People Under the Stairs, even uh, Nightmare on Elm Street came from newspaper articles. I remember reading an article in the LA Times about, I believe, Cambodian refugees. And because they were so disoriented and so, uh, you know, sort of out of any comfortable surroundings, the Cambodians in the Midwest were unable to wake themselves up and purge themselves of their bad dreams and their nightmares. And they were literally dying in their sleep. <laughs> Wes also has an experience as a child that he and his brother experienced when his parents were out one night. <laughs> Wes looked out of their upstairs window down onto the street and saw a man with soot and scabs and an old hat. A man looked up, looked at little Wes and made eye contact with Wes and freaked Wes out and he closed the curtain or pulled the blinds down or whatever was necessary told his brother about it, was freaked out, was afraid to look back out, peeked again, and the guy was still looking right at the place in the window where Wes had looked out. The kind of peak pictures that I've made were very much my kind of reading of the current sort of psychological, social situation that I perceived in the world, in the United States in specific, uh, to uh, kind of a, a B-movie genre format, but making it as deep as I could and as deeply embedded in kind of the cultural zeitgeist of the time. We knew we were going into really a very unstable environment. Um, Haiti had had a, uh, essentially a citizen's revolution about nine months before where they had thrown baby Doc out. And, and the only real law and order in the place was um, the army and the voodoo priests. So uh, we were able to hire the army, and then with the voodoo priest, we basically just went in and said, we want to make this movie about voodoo, and we want to be respectful to it, and uh, we want your help and protection. So uh, we were guided to the, supposedly the most powerful voodoo and uh, priest on the island, and um, he sort of basically gave us protection, and he actually gave us an assignment because we were on a location scout at the time. He said, the next time you come back, bring me uh, some gold chains and some other things. And so David and Ladd and I actually uh, like found ourselves two weeks later in Beverly Hills going into a jewelry store buying gold chains. And the, the guy finally says, are these for a little girl? Are they for an adult? We said, no, actually, it's for a voodoo ceremony. <laughs> we had a very, very personal, hands-on um, experience with all of the sort of voodooan culture. And a lot of the, like, the ceremonies on screen are being performed by real voodooan people who do that. And um, quite often, the people that were playing voodoo and people were the actual characters from Wade Davis's life. So, yeah, it was very, very real. As opposed to the Hollywood voodoo, it is a whole religion, and they have ceremonies for, I mean, 90% of it is ceremonies just like Christianity or Judaism would be. And then there's this little sliver of voodoo that is involved with making. Um, you know, zombies, which is a, kind of a little splinter group. And they do all these kind of dangerous spells and uh, create zombies. They're absolutely real, but they're not what most people think. They're not people that have died and been brought back, but they are people that have been poisoned in a way with a psychotropic drug called tetrodotoxin, I believe, a tetrodotoxin. 
um, which is a very, very complex drug that makes you appear to be dead, but you're actually, you have respiration and heartbeat, but it's very, very spare, to the point that a doctor, if he's not really looking for it, will miss it. And most people in Haiti, if they appear to die, they are buried quickly because there's not refrigeration or processing of bodies. There's two processes. One is they sort of knock you out and make you appear to be dead. You're buried, and then the person that did that to you, who knows you're not really dead, will let you wake up in the coffin, <laughs> gasp for air, claw, you know, suffocate. The last second they dig you out, because people are buried in very shallow graves there. And then they have a second part of the process where they give you uh, Datura, which is a very powerful hallucinogenic drug. And they just keep giving it to you and keep beating you and keep telling you that you're, they're taking your soul until you literally, most of your neural circuits are burned out. So there you are, you're a person completely traumatized, you're convinced your soul is gone, and you're, you're, it's like somebody gave you 2,000 acid trips in a row. All of your relatives think you're dead, and then they just let you go. So here's this dazed you know, person, damaged mentally, goes wandering through the countryside, and the first person to sees them recognizes, oh my God, it's the living dead. Richard Maxwell um, was our writer, and we were doing a rewrite on the third act when we were down there just at the end of pre-production. And he was doing interviews, and he interviewed the, um, the man who taught Wade Davis, who was the writer of the original book, how, to, how he made zombies. And um, so Richard went down and interviewed this guy. And at the end, Richard, who was interested in all sorts of spiritual things, said, I'd love to be indoctrinated into uh, voodoo sometime. And the guy, who was a very sly character, said, well, then you will be. So somehow he must have dosed Richard in that visit because Richard came back and just basically went mad in the course of a week. He locked himself into his room. He stopped wearing clothes. He, he was telling us he was writing, but he couldn't concentrate. And finally, the day before we started shooting, actually, in the morning we started shooting, I woke up at like 5 in the morning. Somebody was knocking on my door of my room. <laughs> He'd come in over the rooftop and onto my patio. I opened the door. Here's Richard, dazed and haggard, unshaven. I looked down. His, all around his feet are cigarette butts. He'd been there for half the night. And he said, I just wanted to wish you good luck because the voodooans and the producers are in league against me and they're going to kill me. And he was literally taken to an airplane, flown from where we were, way out in the boondocks to uh, Port-au-Prince and then put on an airplane. And his wife met the plane in Miami, took him back to Los Angeles, and four days later he woke up lucid, and the last thing he remembered was that guy saying, well, then you will be. <laughs> the thing about Wes that I always find so interesting is that Wes uh, always is, and it, maybe it'll come through in his interview, saying that he doesn't really like to make horror films and uh, you know, that he would rather be doing something else, and, um, but he's so good at it. I enjoy doing horror. I mean, it's not enjoyable to do something that requires intensity when there is a system set up to then attenuate that intensity. Then it's like, oh, oh, oh. you know, I, all those months I worked to make it really intense and I'm really excited about it, and then at the last minute, there's this anonymous group. I think uh, in the area of censorship, I've really only made one film that was uncensored for a while. That was Last House on Left. I didn't even know about the MPAA. Sean knew about it, and we sent the film off to them, and I think we did five or six submissions, and they, they just cut it down to, I think it was like some 60 minutes or something. And Sean finally just said, the hell with it. And he said, put it all back. And we put it all back. And uh, he went down the hall to somebody that had a film that had been rated R and borrowed their negative that had the R rated. <laughs> I hope the statute of limitations are over. But uh, So we just released it as an R rating, but it was totally uncensored. <laughs> the shock of The Last House was I applied what I saw in uncut footage from Vietnam to a genre film. And people were 
furious and outraged, but to me it was just, oh, well, that's reality. <laughs> Thereafter, and increasingly so, everything I've done, and I think everything in John Carpenter and all the rest of the guys have done has been censored. Shocker had something like 13 submissions. No more Mr. Nice Guy. And all they would say is, well, you know, it's too intense. So you have to take the music out, they say, or take the sound effects out or whatever. So at a certain point you feel like, well, if this is what I do really well, and I'm trying to do something intense, and these people are set up to make me not be intense, what's the point? What do you want? I want to hear you scream. <laughs> The world itself has such horrific elements to it that the criticism of any director that you went too far is just, to me, totally bullshit. I went to, did a religious ceremony uh, recently at the Director's Guild where a bunch of like nuns and people that were religious colleagues said, you know, uh, where, why do you put these terrible ideas out there? And I just said, you know, what world do you live in? I want to come visit and maybe, you know, live there. Because, to me, uh, the world is full of shocking and terrifying things. So, I don't know, it just, uh, it seems silly to say, you know, is there something you wouldn't put on screen? No. No. Except an untruth. I, you know, I hope that I won't put something that's false on the screen. But, uh, everything else I think people should have the option to see if they want to. Do you remember your deepest, darkest childhood fears? Was it a monster in the closet or the boogeyman under your bed? For me, it was that hairy mole under Aunt Millie's lip. Oof. But there is no terror greater than what the imagination of a child can rattle up. And there's no one better to tell us about the horror of innocence than Guillermo del Toro. I remember that as a child in the crib, uh, already I saw monsters in my room. I saw we had one of those 1960s shaggy rugs, you know, that, and, I, and I used to wake up in my crib and look at it and see a sea of green fingers instead of the green uh, fibers of the carpet moving and I, and I couldn't go to the bathroom. <laughs> And I started peeing on my crib, and my mother started punishing me. One night, I got up on my crib, and I said to the monsters that I saw in the closet and on the carpet and all around me, I said, if you let me go pee, I'll be your friend forever. And uh, the next night, they were not there. And I've been peeing normally ever since. But I became the friend, so it's a deal. I was born in uh, uh, the second largest city in Mexico called Guadalajara. So I grew up with universal monsters in the afternoon of Sunday, every Sunday. And then uh, a double bill on the theater with Hammer Films, Mario Baba. It was a, a steady diet of really odd sensibility horror films. It was, it was I just knew that this was the type of film I wanted to do from the start. Sometimes people ask me, aren't you bothered by being cataloged as a horror director? I said, no, it took me a long time to be that. That's what I wanted to be from the start. Uh, since I was about eight years old, I grabbed my, my dad's Super 8 camera and I started doing uh, movies with my my toys all action sequences kind of like blade 2 with a low budget <laughs> i knew i knew back then that uh no one was going to do my special effects because there was no special effects uh, makeup technicians in mexico i decided to formalize my learning of special effects 
Uh, I was already doing effects for my short films, and other people saw them and told me, can you do the effects on my movie? And I would say, yeah. But it was the way to do my movie, Kronos. It took me eight years to make the movie, uh, but during those eight years, I put together little by little a workshop that could handle the effects. And sure enough, when we did Kronos, we were still uh, probably the largest company doing makeup special effects in Mexico. And we did it, and then I closed. I closed the shop. I remember reading about the Mexican vampire and thinking, I'm going to invent a different one. I'm going to come up with a different type of vampire than this. For Kronos, what I wanted to do was to, to basically uh, create an origin for a vampire unlike anything you've ever read or heard about. It started actually as a, a story of a granddaughter fearing that the dead grandfather would return. And then in the middle of writing it, uh, my, my own grandmother got sick and, and, and was bedridden for the next uh, four or five years and eventually died. And I started saying, what if the granddaughter accepts him no matter how bad he looks? No matter if he's rotting away and he's half stapled together. And uh, that gave birth to the, to the movie as it is. To me, Kronos is a love story between a granddaughter and her grandfather. And it deals more with uh, uh, what it is to be alive than what it is to be immortal. The daughter, the granddaughter in Kronos is basically me and the grandfather is my grandmother. And uh, the idea and the episodes behind um, the, the, the children's story in Devil's Backbone are all things I lived. I lived through Jesuit school, a male Jesuit school, which is the equivalent to, to prison life in Mexico. And uh, at the age of 12, more or less at that age, I heard a ghost. I heard the ghost of my dead uncle uh, whisper and, and uh, sigh really close to my, to my face, about a, a foot away from me. In, in what used to be his room. Kenneth. Houses are like stone tapes. They record everything that happens in there. And uh, then sometimes, very rarely, but they do replay. And that's a ghost. And, uh, and that idea, the idea of a ghost being a sentient loop, a thing that just comes alive for a few minutes, every two days, every two years, and it just experiences the same anguish every time it comes alive, I felt that was horrible and that was uh, uh, sad. And I wanted the ghost in the movie to be very sad, to be like that. The best witness you can have for anything is a, is a child, because it's a non-judgmental, uh, fully emotional um, uh, character. I remember finishing Mimic and, and, and really wanting to almost come out for a breath of fresh air, you know, and Devil's Backbone gave me just that. And Devil's Backbone allowed me to go into Blade 2 and fully enjoy Blade 2. You know, I was able to take Blade 2 and make it the pulpish, fun movie it is, and not try to elevate, quote unquote, something. I just do it and make it fun. Visually, the most experimental movie I've made is Blade 2. I enjoyed experimenting with new techniques, new type of camera moves, and crazy patterns in the color palette or, or textures, and just had a blast. And uh, I'm really looking forward to the next one, which is Hellboy. I, am, uh, I have achieved the legendary happiness of an eight-year-old now that I'm 38. I'm happier, I'm freer now, 
and I'm having more fun doing movies now than ever. No one has to add demand from you to grow up because you are an official <laughs> stunted person. <laughs> you know, you, you, you are frozen in childhood. A knife-wielding maniac outside your house. An alien invasion inside your body. And no one lives happily ever after. Horror movies rebel against Hollywood, and no one knows that better than John Carpenter, who breaks all the rules and makes up his own. There's nothing more fun than making a horror film. The minute the gore comes out, the blood, the guts, the knives, you're having a blast. Everybody loves that stuff on the set. It is so much fun. The bloodier, the better. There are only two horror stories that you can tell. I mean, there's ba two basically tem templates of a horror story. And very quickly, I can illustrate them. If you imagine we're all sitting around a campfire in the old days and the medicine man is standing there. And we're a tribe and he says, let me tell you where the evil is. It's out there beyond the darkness. It's the other, it's the other tribe. It's the beasts in the woods. That's the, that's the evil. That's one story, the evil from outside. Same situation, we're in a, a circle around a campfire, Our, the medicine man or the holy man stands up and says, I'll tell you where evil is, it's right in here. It's in our human hearts, it's in us. That's evil on the inside. Two stories. I met this six-year-old child with this blank, pale, emotionless face and the blackest eyes, the devil's eyes. I spent eight years trying to reach him, and then another seven trying to keep him locked up because I realized that what was living behind that boy's eyes was purely and simply evil. I don't know that I ever thought um, any of us who worked on Halloween thought it would ever be a, a big hit. As a matter of fact, when it was first re released, it was not. Um, it got bad reviews, and nobody was going to see it, and then it kind of caught on. But those were the days when I was just trying to direct movies, you know, and I was still just trying to learn it. Since 1975, I had written screenplays, so finally somebody was hiring me as a director, and I was overjoyed, so I didn't care what kind of movie I was doing. When you make a film like that, well, when anybody makes any kind of film that's a success, you get typecast. And at first, I think because I was young, I probably rebelled a little inside against it. But finally, I came to accept it and enjoy it. It's given me a whole career. I love John for his, you know, John's always in the batting cage there, man. He's always hitting them out, you know, and trying his damnedest. I mean, I love some of it. I think it's wonderful. They Live, I think, is maybe one of the most underrated films ever, maybe. I have come here to chew bubblegum and kick ass. And I'm all out of bubblegum. Oh, shit. Oh. See, I'm from a different time. I grew up in a time when we were rebelling against some of the cliches of old Hollywood, the, the happy ending, the, the hero and, the, and the, the girl live happily ever after. You know, we got a chance, and I think it's completely different now, we got a chance to experiment and do different things, but then the audience began to not like that anymore. They wanted their certainty again.
Well, it's interesting about the thing, the criticism of the thing, all I can do is look at it from the inside and listen to what other people have said. It was too vicious. It was too dark a film, too nihilistic. I'm always attracted to that kind of, a kind of story where what's going on here? You know, who, who, is, who is telling the truth and who isn't? Um, maybe it's my own worldview. One of the criticisms on me was that I had violated the sacred oath of Hollywood, which is that if you're gonna make one of these terrible kind of awful horror movies or movies that have to do with blood and killing and horrible things, you don't show too much. The cliche in Hollywood is you never bring it out in the light, you see. And that way you're kind of exempt from, from the pornography of violence that people will accuse you of. Well, I didn't do that. None of us did that. We brought it right out in the light. Well, John Carpenter's movie, The Thing, is, uh, is brilliant, I think. And, you know, it was very much in, in my mind when I was working on From Beyond. I mean, that was the movie that had really kind of uh, shown what was possible using mechanical uh, and makeup effects, you know, taking them as far as you possibly can. Um, so a very, very hard act to follow. With The Thing, literally, it just uh, predates CG effects without CG effects. You know, he creates things that you just shake your head and say, how the hell did they do that? All the effects were done later. All the scene with the actors was done first. We had nothing. We didn't know what was going to happen. We knew because of Rob's concept about the, the creature, about the thing. We knew, I knew, and both of us knew, that we can do something really special if we just try really hard. The thing can look like anything. You see, it's not one monster. It's not like the creature from the Black Lagoon who always looks the same. This thing can go completely insane, so it's only your imagination that limits you. He used a lot of carbopole. I don't know if you know what that is, but that's the stuff that you put in Twinkies. Kind of holds it all together. It's this camera, and it's real gooey. That's kind of the slime. Basic, basic slime for monsters is carbopole. Bubble gum, and he uses it, just all kinds of different kind of rubber to stretch and pull. And we had this little mechanical <laughs> head that was on a car, a little remote control car model. And it's kind of going like across, across the floor. You gotta be fucking kidding. And we burned it up. That's all we had. So you have to give Rob Bottin and Dean Cundy a whole lot of credit for shooting this stuff. And all of us really worked hard to make it look as realistic as possible. Because in essence, it's all rubber. You got a, you got a rubber sitting on the floor and he wanted to make it look like it's crawling across the floor. So it's a trick to do that. A lot of artistry went into that. One glimpse of John Carpenter coming out of a Directors Guild meeting, we, we, we met in the parking lot, and he gets into this incredibly cool GTO with its uh, like a little electronic tachometer on, and he's smoking unfiltered cigarettes. And you just know this guy doesn't give a damn about what anybody thinks, and he's not politically correct, and he's just his own man. You know? I think I would say this of, of Dario Argento, of Wes Craven, of Toby Hooper, and myself, regardless of whether the movies work or not, they're ours, they're our expression. They're our expression of how we see things. And it's a vastly different uh, era. Now, Toby once said to me, uh, horror movies are like the old time westerns used to be. We used to crank out westerns in the old days to play. That's what we did. We made these horror films. <laughs> The world does not become a safer place. The world becomes a dangerous becomes a dangerous place more and more so. You don't see evil and going away in human beings. You see it growing, and which is only, you know, fuel for our fire. That's what keeps us going. Guess who's coming to dinner? All your neighbors, and you're the main course. Zombies, flesh-eating, gut-munching, garden-variety zombies. No matter how many times you kill them, they keep coming back for more, don't you? More than any other master, 
George A. Romero used these flesh eaters as the genesis for bringing horror closer to home and gave it a face we all recognize, ourselves. Well, I grew up on EC comic books, and, um, and actually when I was first of an age to be allowed to go to movies alone, the Universal monsters were all in re-release, so I got to see Frank and Drac and those cats big screen as a kid. I can't even imagine that I that I created, you know, a creature of any kind. I, I don't see it that way. I mean, they were they're they're zombies. They just happen to you know be white. They don't work in a cotton plantation. They're blue collar monsters. George Romero was a big influence on me because of I think Night of the Living Dead. Uh, that was a transforming film. Like Psycho, I think Chain is the beginning of the modern horror movie. Up to then, you had universal horrors and you had a lot of uh, Hammer movies, but Psycho came along and bango, uh, everything changed. And then George transformed it once again in 1968, 69 with Night of the Living Dead. That was an amazing film. He invented a whole world. Originally, uh, we set out to make this a very high-minded, almost Bergman-esque kind of film, which was not my vote, but this was a de democracy. But we, we could never sell tickets to that movie, I mean to investors who would actually pony up a few bucks. So we decided to do a horror thing. I always wanted to do it. And then, I, then of course, right after Night of the Living Dead became Night of the Living Dead, uh, I fled. You know, I said, oh, man, I'm going to get stuck here. and. Um, even though I love it, I didn't want to be stuck there. So the next couple of things I did were not, you know, all the way f flat out uh, horror things. Second one was a romantic comedy. Romero, most of the time, is doing social commentary, you know, and uh, I think his not, not Living Dead movies are fantastic commentaries about society. All right, Vince, hit him in the head, right between the eyes. With the original night, it was late 60s, we were all involved in, you know, the, in social criticism of one kind or another. And uh, so I think those attitudes all crept in. I mean, we lived in that farmhouse, and we, all, we would hang around at night. It definitely crept in, I and mean, we talked a lot about what, what does this represent, and, and the fact that it was purely an accident that the lead role was cast um, with a black actor who happened to be a friend of ours, who was the best actor available to us. That gave it some power, which, you know, it didn't go unrecognized by us, but we were out to make a horror movie. I think, you know, probably the first story that ever told was a scary story. And um, so often they're parables and they have deeper meanings and, you know. And so we were somewhat aware of it in the first film. In, the, in, in Dawn of the Dead and Day of the Dead, it was much more conscious and therefore I think is much less innocent. <laughs> It's that lack of innocence, I think, that, that, if anything, bothers me about, about those films. You know, once you're aware of it, it's pretty hard to, to put it in the back of your mind and, and work, work the story solely for its own. on Reanimator, uh, you know, George Romero's zombies are like, you know, this is sort of the, you know, he, he, he is the, you know, the guy who put, you know, kind of established what is it, how a zombie behaves. <laughs> you know, you can't think of zombies without thinking of George Romero's zombies. Yeah. 
By the time we made Day, there were, everybody in the world wanted to be zombies. And the dean of the fine arts department at Carnegie Mellon University is the zombie there with his wife. He's the fisherman zombie. You know, people just all want to be zombies and they all want to have the most grotesque makeup and they want to be chewed up if possible. And uh, it's a riot. <laughs> I won the Saturn Award for Day of the Dead. That's the only award I've ever won for special effects because of the realism of it. I didn't feel a need to top with each film, top the last one with the gore. We had, we were better able <laughs> to execute the stuff. Tom had learned and the cats knew how to do it. They had mixed up some blood that looked a little more real. <laughs> You can't get any better than the real thing. All the intestines were real because you can't get any better than the real thing, you know? I think we were all learning and, you know, gradually we're able to improve the effects. Tom came up with some really ingenious effects in Day. God, there's so much in Day of the Dead. That was a heavy effects film. We, we shot, killed, squibbed, tore heads off, you know, crushed heads with two before us. Left to my own devices, I probably, I mean, if it was totally a decision based entirely on aesthetics, I might have not, I might have gone less, particularly in, in day. But I had this vague notion that it was like a wake up call. People are running from the theater, and those of us, like you and I, who are diehards, are sitting there giggling, wanting more. Do it to me! So <laughs> I love George's dead movies. And he struggles with how the Hollywood system, doesn't trust it, and hates it. And I, I feel bad, because I was the one who encouraged him to come here. I said, yeah, they're not so bad. He came here and I said, yes, they are. Well, I think a lot of people don't get what I do sometimes. Uh, I don't know that it's a misinterpretation. Because they're, they're looking at it, you know, a, 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 a distribution executive is going to look at a film with completely different eyes than, an, than a member of the audience or than you or I or a filmmaker particularly. You know, they're looking for, you know, they want to watch the movie and be able to imagine the poster instantly in their minds. And if they can't see the poster, you know, then how am I going to sell this piece of shit? And uh, that's happened to me a lot. <laughs> when I was trying to pitch the, the, the new zombie film, they said, what's it about? And I went in and I, I would say, well, it's about ignoring the problem. And they would say, yeah, but I mean, who, who, what's the story? What are the characters? And I'd say, well, you can do it 50 different ways, you know. They don't want to hear that. And it's a, basically, it's about ignoring the problem, which I don't know that anybody is doing after September 11th. We're starting to ignore the problem again. I had this conceit that the first one was 60s, next one was 70s, next one was 80s, and I wanted to do one for the 90s. And really, the script that I wrote is more 90s than... Um, you know, certainly pre-September 11. And um, so I feel I have time, you know, to absorb what the, uh, what the, the, uh, the new millennium brings us or the new decade brings. All right, I know what you're saying. All this fancy talk about horror movies is neat and all, but when do we get to see the monster? Well, you're in luck, you sickos. Horror may come from the imagination, but the monster comes from a warehouse in North Hollywood. And it's the masters of makeup that bring them to life. Now, one of the greatest monsters ever was created right before our eyes in John Landis's An American Werewolf in London, a movie that sparked a revolution and showed us like never before that horror was indeed changing. My generation that got interested, people like Dennis Murin, who now runs ILM, or Rick Baker, 
these guys had a, a love for the genre and there's this weird change. It starts in the early 70s and, and works its way through, which was you always saw these low-budget shitty movies, but they were pretty well scripted, pretty well acted, pretty well directed until you cut to the bad rubber monster because they had no money to spend on that. Or you'd cut to the rocket ship, which would go, you know. Then starting in the 70s, New World Pictures and stuff, suddenly with people like Rob Bottin and Rick Baker and, and you know, these new... I'm trying to think Craig Reardon, there's so many of them. The, um, oh, Phil Tippett. I mean, these, these, these incredibly craftspeople coming up. You had this weird thing, which was bad movies, <laughs> poorly made, but fantastic monsters. The monsters were great. The rocket ships were so slick, you know. It was just weird. And now, because of Lucas and Spielberg, the, you know, the Jaws and Star Wars phenomenon, suddenly B pictures are now A pictures. Now, there is no such thing as B-product. It's all crap. Yeah, I, horror movies are what got me into this. I mean, you know, like I said earlier, the universal horror movies, especially uh, all the great work that Jack Pierce once did, was what inspired me to, to, to make monsters for a living. Basically, that's what I wanted to do, is be the monster maker. We have some stuff from a movie that's... Uh, very fond of, which is American Werewolf in London. Uh, I first found out about American Werewolf in London when I was doing Schlock, which was John Landis' first film. Schlock! So I wanted to make a, a low-budget movie about low-budget movies. And it was my great good fortune to find Rick Baker, actually. So I was 21 and he was 20, and for 60,000 bucks, half of which was mine, and the other half we got from relatives, my relatives and, and people, we made Schlock. John played the Schlock Thropacy missing link type uh, character. Partly to save money, um, which was my real reason, and then partly because the, schlock, the, the major, the evolution of that project is that my original intention was to have a pretty bad gorilla suit. And when I saw Rick's stuff, which is, you know, this kid with long hair, little, his models on the walls, his work was so superior. This guy was so obviously an artist and, and, and so good. That suddenly schlock. Now I look at the movie, and as bad as it is, I mean, the thing that works in it is schlock, you know, and it works because Rick, his makeup, you could do such expressive stuff. And I wanted a particular kind of performance, and, you know, all the actors were amateurs, and so I figured, fuck it, I'll be schlock. Because, no, I don't think anyone else would have sat through that makeup. Dude. The demands on that makeup were ridiculous because I. Even if I didn't appear as the monster until the afternoon, Rick and I still had to get up at two in the morning and he had to four hours putting it on. And then I directed as this ape all day, you know. And John was telling me that his next film was gonna be this film that he'd already written it at that time. He was 21 years old. Um, his next film was gonna be an American Werewolf in London. I gave him the script in 1971, so he had a long time. I mean, we made the movie in 81. <laughs> and so he had a long time to think about it. He wanted to do a transformation in a way that had never been done before. He said he didn't seem to him right that if you're going to change into a werewolf that you would sit down in a chair like Lon Chaney Jr. did and you know, plant your head in the corner of the chair so that you would stay still and not move until the transformation was complete. He really felt that it would be painful and he wanted to show the pain and he wanted him to be able to writhe all around in, in agony. <laughs> um, it was very difficult what I said what I wanted for Rick, which is that in the script it's specific about how painful it is. It's not a pleasant experience. Also that it be in bright light, harsh light actually, which is very unfair to a makeup. And so he said, so figure it out. So I said, okay, cool, because I've always, you know, the universal horror films always, you know, it's what started me in the business. And, and uh, I always liked that transformation stuff and I, I loved werewolves, so I, I couldn't wait to sink my teeth into this, this one. And, uh, we ended up doing what we called change-o heads and change-o hands and change-o backs for the transformations we actually made. This is the number two change-o head. We had a, a head that resembled the makeup that David wore. And this head had little, like, pneumatic rams that would actually push forms out and push the, the muzzle forward and the cheekbones, and it would actually physically change shape right in front of the lens. There were no opticals involved. Uh, which made for a kind of a disappointing shoot. We shot this in, in post-production. We finished the whole film. Uh, they had the wrap party, and then the next day we filmed the transformation. 
with a smaller crew, and it was really, uh, you know, we'd get the camera set up, and John would say, action, and they had him go, go, okay, cut, and he goes, oh, I think we got that, you know, and it's like, I think we got that. We, we spent months on this, and that's it, you know, so. <laughs> Something that, that I liked about this, I really like the second stage change I had. What I did was there's two sides to it, really. It's very asymmetrical. The, this side over here is much more like the final wolf. It, it has a lot of the forms of the final wolf, and it's, it's transformed more. This side is the more human side, and, and it's, it's got more of what David looked like, and it's got a little more sympathy to it. It's a little sadder. This side's a little more evil. <laughs> And this is one of the, I think we made three or four heads for American Werewolf in London. This is one of the wolf heads. Uh, John Landis wanted the wolf to be a, a, you know, demon dog from hell, basically. He wanted, he wanted a four-legged wolf. I was really pushing for a biped wolf, a two-legged wolf. Yeah, I wanted the werewolf to be four-footed. I wanted it to be a big wolf monster. It just was really ferocious looking, and it, and it would just, you know, be like this. You know, the Rick or whoever, Elaine, whoever was working it, like Rick would be holding it. And all he had to do was go like that. And you'd go, ah! <laughs> you know, it really had tremendous life. And it was pretty, it was great. Rick and I disagree totally, but I think I showed it too much. I was very enamored of his work. I thought it was great. And I think I showed it too much, but he doesn't. <laughs> This particular head we used in the, in the sequence in the moors where it first attacked Griffin Dunn. And we were, it was like in the middle of the night, it was freezing cold, and I'm puppeteering this head. It's got like this big kind of scissor thing inside that, that makes the mouth work. Just, it was such a, basically a simple puppet, you know, but uh, he's beautifully sculpted. Uh, the very first take, Griffin really got very into attacking, the, you know, fighting with this wolf. The very first take, he grabbed onto the side of his face, and completely pulled the foam rubber skin off the skull. Um, so I'm out in the middle of no place, freezing cold, had to repair the damn thing. So the next take, I got my revenge on, on Griffin. So when I was puppeteering the thing, I was beating the shit out of him, basically. <laughs> you know, so. We also had these things that we called Nazi demons, as they were called in the script. And uh, I, I wasn't quite sure what a Nazi demon was. But um, I always liked the shape of those Nazi helmets. So the first thing I did was kind of sculpt this helmet. And then uh, I did a number of different designs, um, some of them based on, you know, looking in the mirror. One of them was this kind of bald guy with this kind of sideways grimacey face. And I did another one that was kind of a rotted wolf, like a, like a werewolf, rotten kind of werewolf kind of guy. A couple different crazy, then another one was pretty much like a werewolfy kind of deal. It was just kind of like, you know, fun monsters with Nazi helmets and knives and guns and stuff, you know. It was a, it was a fun sequence to shoot. John likes to blow up things, you know, so we had a lot, a lot of fun in that. You know, funny thing happened when we did an American Werewolf in London and, and did the transformation. People seem to think that we could do anything. And a good example of that is when I got the script for Videodrome. David Cronenberg film. David sent me the script that had so much weird stuff in it that I just said, how the hell are we going to do this? And didn't have a clue about how to attempt some of this, but it was really challenging and fun. He had this gun that, you know, uh, the James Wood character pulled out of his insides and became flesh and shot cancer, basically. And in the script, I think it said he was shot with this cancer bullet, and then the cancer started to multiply and and uh, grow all over his body. And, and I said, well, I don't know how the hell we're going to do that. <laughs> so we ended up making a, a rubber likeness head of, of, of the actor that played uh, Barry Convex and, and had these hot melt vinyl cancerous tumor things that we puppeteered with our hands, and it was basically we were under the floor uh, operating this puppet and shoving this stuff up through and moving it around as he as he you know, was shot by this cancer gun. I, I, you know, 
I like making monsters. I definitely would like to have more opportunities making monsters, but I don't particularly want to do, you know, a Friday the 13th where all I do is kill teenagers in, in different ways. I, 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 uh, I don't find that as, as rewarding as actually creating a character of some sort, you know, be that character a monster or a, or a fat black man, you know, whatever it is, you know, it's like, it's fun, you know, but uh, I, I would definitely, I hope I get more opportunities to do horror films. Whatever happened to Rick Baker, anyway, you know, it's too bad because he was talented. They say beauty is in the eye of the beholder, but for our next master, beauty is in the eyeball itself. Italian master Dario Argento has terrified audiences worldwide with some of the most spectacularly gruesome kills ever to be captured on film. Argento has mixed a potent palette to elevate horror into an art form, turning violence into perverse beauty. As far as I'm concerned, Dario Argento is in a whole different category than other horror directors. I mean, it's hard not to like, you know, it's hard not to, to like the colors and to, get, and, and to get drawn into his atmosphere. It's almost like you're being pulled into a painting. Dario's movies are like uh, bad dreams. You know, his movies have a very dreamlike quality, and uh, they're, they don't follow the rules of, of real life at all. fusion of visual style, which is totally unique and all his own, story and music and mood that transforms his movies into something I don't think anybody else can do. I think it started to fascinate me when I was still very young. I read by chance from my father's library a book of short stories by Edgar Allan Poe. For the first time, as a boy, I discovered a world so strange and mysterious that I never could have imagined where the conflicts are terrible and curses follow you for generations. I come from a cinematic family. My father made movies. My mother, too, was in the movies. Of course, they liked a more traditional type of cinema, the classic cinema. They saw this predisposition of mine for the fantastic, horror, mystery genre, and it was censored by them. They saw it as a flaw in my character, and they tried to change it. Anybody who doesn't understand his work, watch Suspiria. And forget the story. Hey, the stories make no sense at all. It doesn't matter what the story is. But all of a sudden, you're in this, where am I? What world is this? He, that's where he takes you. I think atmosphere is created when you shoot a movie. It gets created also when you think, but then it must be followed. You plunge into the project. Everybody, actors, technicians, they all have to enter into the spirit of the project. I explain it very much in detail. There cannot be a dissonant voice. The movie must have one style. If he does not agree, he better leave. They must participate in the project. The project is my movie. But everybody has to bring their potential to this project. One of the things that I love about Dario Argento's films is that he has absolutely no restraints on showing you the most horrifying imagery. But he does it. He, one thing he does that I wish I could do and I just can't bring myself to do it, he does it in such a beautiful way that it makes it doubly chilling. Oh my God. The effect is just amazing. You have these beautiful women being just horribly mutilated and it's gorgeous to look at. No, I don't think I ever went too far. I made movies which are my dreams. Perhaps for some critic or censors, I did. 
In fact, they edited out some of the scenes, but I think they made a mistake, because those were the scenes I imagined without malice. It was some reflections on some dreams or fantasies, which are an artistic fact. And even in films that uh, haven't been um, tremendously successful of his, there's always just extraordinary stuff in it. He's a guy that goes for the fences, man. He and Carpenter, you know, I mean, just go for the fences and forget about it, you know. So if you strike out, cool, but you might hit a home run. There is an interest in this world which emerges as an alternative to ours. This is what scares us. The ghosts. All of these things. The dead who come back. The crazy people. The killers who nobody knows why they have to kill. It's a big part in which there are many stories. It's an extremely vast area. There's so much to tell. I think five lives would not be enough. Sweltering summer day, a remote farmhouse, the stench of rotting flesh all around. And that's before the director shouts action. Sometimes it's the conditions on the set that can be the worst horror of all. Toby Hooper found out the hard way during filming of the classic Texas Chainsaw Massacre, a film that would forever change the way we think about power tools and barbecue. When I saw Texas Chainsaw Massacre, I mean, I think that's really a scary very funny by the way but really a scary scary movie one of the movies that had a practical impact in my life was texas chainsaw massacre from that moment until four years later i didn't eat any meat i became a total vegetarian and uh, then one day i ate three chickens in a one single sitting <laughs> and that ended The horror genre had gotten kind of boring. And, and, and also, I loved the genre, and I wanted to see something that gave me my tickets, money's worth. And, and I figured I was, you know, paying, I don't know what, two bucks a ticket, a dollar and a half a ticket, whatever. But, and I was getting about 10 cents worth of scare. A friend of mine suggested that, that I go to the student union and see this black and white movie. Uh, that uh, the, it was getting quite a lot of response, and it was uh, Night of the Living Dead. And I walked out of it, thinking, yeah, okay, that's, that's the way to do it. That's, that's a good skyrocket that can be seen from far away. So I was, I was Christmas shopping, and... and, and, and uh, uh, and I was in the hardware department. It was something like a Sears store, and uh, and, and and God, God, I hate you know I hate crowds. I hate I hate them closing in on you. And so, so they were closing in, and I was kind of like freaking, you, you know, just just wanted to get out of there, get out of the crowd. And so, uh, I found myself in front of a chainsaw display in the hardware department, and, and I, this, that's where the idea came from. Uh, well, if I pick this damn thing up and start it, you know, they'll part like, a, like the Red Sea. And I can get out of here. Well, I didn't do that, of course. But, but, but when I got home, uh, by the time I got home, and, and um, I think the entire structure seemed to come like in, in, in like in one package, maybe like a nanosecond. But the, the configuration of the hitchhiker, 
the cook, and then everything tumbling back into itself. Uh, it was like an, an, an instant, an immediate notion that came out of that experience of, uh, of wanting to get out of that crowd. <laughs> Leatherface came from the family doctor. He told me when I was uh, 10 or 11 years old that he, uh, um, when he was in pre-med school, he skinned a cadaver's face and cured, you know, dried it out and wore it for a masked uh, Halloween party. So, okay, that's cool. We got the, uh, the skeleton from uh, India uh, through a pharmaceutical company. And, and the real skeletons are less expensive than the plastic one but you know i'm just wondering like, where do they get these skeletons you know where do they have skeleton farms how do they get perfect ske and, and they're cheaper than plastic ones you know it was in august it was like 110 you know every day and we would tent the house you know to shoot you know night for day and uh, and then it was like 120 degrees, and the and the props weren't cured yet, and they would start, you know, vaporizing as they dried up. And uh, but there was there was an atmosphere. We were living it, and it, and 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 we we were in that August Texas heat uh, to 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 the point that it was. Uh, uh, it, you know, it was real. The heat, the atmosphere, the, and it was such long hours that uh, uh, it, one definitely blurred into the other. We shot for four solid weeks, seven days a week, 12 to 16 hours a day. And after a while, we were just zombies. We were so burned out. I think it shows in the film. If you've tapped into the the spirit or the nerve or, or whatever this thing that comes up, if you throw a net over it and capture it, and you're in the, in there with with the demon, it's uh, it's in your life, and and you take it home with you and you, you bring it back to the set. It crossed over from acting into that, and at the dinner sequence, when I'm poking her and hitting her, it, yeah, it was real. Yeah, it wasn't that I didn't like Marilyn. It was just like. You know, been up for a long time. And you get a little crazy because you're being asked over and over and over to do crazy things. And I just had to make sure, you know, everything is safe. I mean, everybody is, you know. Jeez, everyone on this film. Daniel, Daniel Pearl operating the camera almost got an eye knocked out with a, a dolly shot traveling so fast in the woods that... The camera hit a tree and jammed. Everybody, everybody got injured. That just kept reminding you. We're talking about flesh and blood and life. I could barely see out of the mask. I could see only directly in front of me. I had no peripheral vision at all. So that made the chase sequences very difficult. Gunnar's mask had ridden up on him, and uh, he was with the chainsaw and he you know and of course now we're doing a long shot so the cast and the crew are all like you know 50 yards away and the perspective you could see it plain as day where he's getting closer and closer and closer and he doesn't realize it and he's about to cut her in half in real time and everybody's going ah, ah, ah. and Gunnar's, Gunnar's meanwhile thinking I'm really doing a good job boy they're yelling for me and yelling me on <laughs> he's just about to kill this woman you know and, you know, and Toby's going well let me get a little bit closer <laughs> My favorite scene to shoot was actually the dance at the end. I just started swinging the saw and kind of stamping around. And then I noticed, and they cleared everybody away, and I could barely see out of the mask. And I noticed that there was the cameraman standing there with the camera on me, and Toby was standing behind him. And then they would move around me as I moved. And at one point I had sort of swung the saw, and I realized that Toby had ducked. So the reason it was such a pleasure to do that scene is I started swinging the saw at Toby. I was imagining that I was going to kill Toby with the saw. So I, it was with great pleasure. That's when I started really dancing around and spinning and swinging that saw, was that I wanted to scare them with what I was doing. I wasn't angry at Toby. I thought he was great. I think it was just the frustration and the sort of, just the desire to do, to do something back, you know, after suffering for four weeks of shooting.
But Chainsaw has this reputation for being so um, uh, visceral and bloody and gory, and and you know it isn't. And uh, I mean, the blood's there; it's dried on the walls, and then and the girl on the meat hook when you know when you when I pan down her body to show the wash tub underneath, it is obviously to catch you know a lot of fluid. There's nothing dripping from her. It's just you put it together in your mind because it makes sense. Chainsaw One had was was a, a play about morality uh, in, in a strange way and family values, and it was all bubbling up out of the times and out of Watergate. And once again, I underline we we found out uh, as a na naive students such that, that hey, they, they don't always tell you the truth. So it was about a film about a bad day. You know, for everyone, actually a bad day for Leatherface. And everyone. <laughs> the spot that we shot Chainsaw One on is now Dell Computers. And the house, they moved it to another little town and turned it into a restaurant. But just the house, and but but without any reference to what it is. I would have taken it. I would have turned it into a barbecue restaurant straight away, and you know, it would have been fun. The remake idea has been around about four, three, four years. I got a call from the casting people because they were interested in having me be in the movie. And the first thing out of this casting person's mouth is this is a retelling of this film now this time it's going to be a dark psychological horror it's not going to be a bloodbath like the original and I thought have you ever seen this movie I wonder if they get it and I wonder why they need to remake the film why do you need to remake a movie that already did its job really well if it's successful and becomes a classic it's going to be remade and 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 I've I have um, kind of uh, uh, you, you know I had, I had to have been a little philosophic about that and and um, and it's a fact you know it's a fact it's a, it, they, you know they remade Frankenstein remade Dracula and but still there's only one original. You're probably curled up in a fetal position, drooling all over yourselves and wondering if this sick and twisted gore fest will ever end. Why don't I let the real masters answer that? The reason that horror or suspense or movies about evil won't die is because it doesn't ever go away. I would like to see it get scary again. I would like to see people scream again. A genre film can become a classic if you really put your heart and soul into it, not just in the production, but in the depth of it. The fact that you can make images that are essentially really great metaphors for things. You know, horror films, I, I, I think, um, deal with our fears, and I think everyone has a need to, you know, express them. And it was very interesting to me that after 9-11, the most popular movies were horror films. Is less more? Fuck no. I mean, more is more. I mean, anything worth doing is worth overdoing. They've always underestimated horror fans. They always go, look, these people are idiots. Just kill more people, have more blood, have more gore, have more effects. That's why they're here. And that's not really the case with a lot of horror fans. I mean, reality's horrific. You know, monster movies are controlled and and fun. In real life, are there ghosts and werewolves and UFOs flying around? Sorry. Uh, do I believe in the supernatural? <laughs> sure. <laughs> Something better be there. In part, I believe in it. The rest is just the product of charlatans. There's no doubt. Uh, that to me is real. The ghosts are real. The supernatural exists in one place. The arts.
hopefully there's some young kids out there that are getting inspired, just like, just like uh, John Carpenter and Toby Hooper and Wes Craven. I'm always hopeful that someone will make a good one. It is not a, 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 an area of film that is welcome with open arms by the entire film community at all. But if you love it, come on in. We need new blood. <laughs> back to studying the old film. What worked in this? Maybe they should just sit down in front of Psycho or Texas Chainsaw Massacre or Night of the Living Dead and take notes. Why does this work for 90 minutes? Why is, there, why is it all killer and no filler? Someone will find that other closed door in that dark room in our head and they'll open it. Party's over. up in a cabin with the forces of evil coming at you from all directions. Just keep telling yourself, it's only a movie. We're rolling, for Christ, del Toro, silencio, por favor. <laughs> I told you, he's a nightmare. Yes? I have a secret uh, method of, of taking myself back there. As I'm going to watch a movie, I watch it at home on my big screen, and I get incredibly stoned first. And that removes any kind of plumbing and any kind of knowledge, and I just enjoy it. Just, wow, look at that. Let me know if I'm looking too serious, too, OK? Give me a hand signal or something. Say, fucking lighten up, buddy. Jesus Christ. <laughs> it's only horror movies. And then I was God. Uh, that was fun. Uh, met him. Did some research. Nicest man. Nicest man. Not a foul word. I think I could change the landscape of pornography. I think it'd be great porn director. <laughs> How so? I'm not going to tell you. <laughs> Kids, have you thought of another occupation? Hi, I'm Howard Berger from KB Effects Group Inc. First thing we're going to do is we're going to make fake blood. And we get a nice clean bucket with a stir stick. And we use caro syrup. And it's basically like, like syrup you put on your pancakes or what have you. 
you do is you open it up, which is always tons of fun. Go ahead and you pour some in to your bucket. Blip, 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 blip. Then we take red food coloring, pour a little bit of red food coloring in. Then we put a little yellow food coloring in. The yellow actually helps neutralize the red so it doesn't look like a big candy apple mess. But now I'm the type of guy that likes my blood really, really dark. So I use this color, it's called caramel. It's kind of like a gross bile color that you find in an old Sam Raimi type movie. Stir it up, so it's really nice. This stuff works great. You can use it for every, whatever you want, you know. Sometimes what we like to do is we, if we have to dress an actor with blood, what we'll do is we'll just splash the blood on. Bang! Bang! Or you can just you know, like shoot all over his chest or have it drip down his face and onto his head. It always looks really, really good, I think. Okay, this is just like a standard razor blade that you can buy at any hardware store or what have you, except that we've dulled this down considerably. We've dulled this down considerably. We've dulled this down considerably. But on the back side, we da -da 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 -da, glued a little tube. And you can get this tubing at like a fish store or, or anything like that or also a, another hardware store. Okay, we've got our blood syringe all hooked up, full of blood, a nice little bulb of blood. We stick that in. And then what you do is this freaks out your mom. This worked for me when I was a kid. Give me your arm for a sec there, I go, that's it, Mom. I've had enough of all this. Ugh. Okay, now let's take a look at this. This is kind of cool. This is something I used to do when I was a kid. I got the same razor blades, and I would go ahead and find a way to, to cut this out very carefully, cut a little wedge. So sometimes I'd go ahead and wedge it into my finger like that, walk in the house. My mom would be all freaked out, especially if you put a little blood on it. You walk on and go, ah, Mom, ah, I, this is killing. i got to get this out. How do I... Ah, you know, I can't go to school. I, I, my dog ate my paper and stuff, shoved a razor blade in my thumb. The other thing that's really cool is there's, you can do whatever you want. This one's good, too, for lips. Ryan, open up. That one's cut out like that. It's half and half. There, and you put a little blood on there. See, that's why you need to x-ray your Halloween candy. Okay, let's look at this now. Okay, this, this is called the pencil through the neck gag. It's actually three pencils through the neck gag. It was used on a film called House on Haunted Hill. It's pretty simple. We have three pencils that are bunched together, cut in half. And uh, we've then suspended them apart, yeah, equal distance there, on a little piece of metal that's been shaped to fit Rye's neck. And once again, we're back to our old friend, the fishing uh, line that pumps the blood, and we've got our blood thing here. So what we do is we put this on Rye's neck, and then we get it to bleed. Oh, no. It's bleeding. Arterial spray. Can I borrow that pencil? Okay. Let's look at some more stuff which actually we should do guts. What we do is we make these out of gelatin. These are just gelatin, and you can use um, Knox gelatin, which is like a gelatin you can buy at the grocery store, and you mix it up and it makes it all goopy, and if you put a little glycerin into it, it's awesome. Now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna have our friend Rye hold these guts, but actually these are dry, so let's get some wet guts, okay? Or else they just don't look right. Look at that, that looks great. There you go, happy birthday, and don't say I never gave you anything. The other thing is that's really cool is this stuff called Nernies, okay? This is just latex. If you get some liquid latex and stipple it out, you know, just kind of brush it on with a brush or a sponge, and um, then kind of rough it up as you're pulling it up, you get this really cool stuff and then powder it down. But if you go ahead and you bloody it up, it's good for like zombie poolage. Like um, we use this on, a lot on Dust Till Dawn. It just snaps away and looks really cool. And also, it's really good for dressing. It's a lovely necklace. We will dress you up nice. It's lovely. Okay, this is the last gag, all right? It's a good one, though. Uh, what I've got is this dummy gun, and it's dummy, it's not real. And I'm gonna blow his brains out, because I'm sick of this shit, I'm telling you. All right, you know what I'm talking about? Motherfucking. <laughs> well, know what, that was weird, because actually, that wasn't supposed to happen that way. I think I, are you okay? Uh, listen, hey, thanks for coming. I hope you guys learned a lot of stuff, and uh, we'll see you later.